century, we also see, you know, the tobacco industry of Connecticut, which has been here for, you know, centuries, playing a major part in attracting, you know, more groups of people. So um, on one hand, you know, we're a little bit in the earlier 20th century, we see a lot of college students coming up north for the summers because the farmers up north need them. So there actually were kind of partnerships between Connecticut farmers reaching out to specific colleges down south saying, send your students up north, right? We've got jobs for them, they can earn a little extra money, they can be away from their parents for the summer, and you know, there is a little bit less of work discrimination up here. And so, many college-age students have jumped upon this opportunity. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. was among those college students. Um, he spent two summers up north here in Connecticut, one on a farm in Simsbury, um, and I forget what town he was in the other time, if anyone knows, you can remind me. Um, but, he, you know, is one of those students that has those experiences where he writes back and says, you know, things are a little different up north. He writes about attending a church service where there were black and white worshipers, you know, celebrating mass or <coughs> service together. Um, and so that's something that, you know, again, kind of small, right, but shows just the difference that geographic location could have on a person's ideology and mentality. Um, we also, though, see this because, again, tobacco remains an important part of our industry today, we see the need for agricultural workers continuing, right? Even past the time when, you know, different labor laws are passed where maybe there's, you know, um, more lucrative, more, you know, interesting opportunities available for college students, um, tobacco still needs to be harvested. And so it became, you know, as we go through kind of after World War II at this point, as we go through the 20th century, it became a really good option for newcomers to Connecticut, particularly immigrant families, right? This is kind of a starting off job, it's in high demand, and then once you've gotten settled, many agricultural workers could find other jobs once they had time in the state, right? In factories, you know, in businesses, offices, what have you. Um, so this was a job held by a lot of West Indian immigrants when they first came to Connecticut in the mid 20th century. And Connecticut continues to have you know, a pretty high population of West Indian immigrants today. Um, this artwork is done by um, Stan McCromwell, who is a artist from Guyana. So he's you know drawn from his own experience as an immigrant working the field, but then also kind of uh, from the encounters, you know, talks, conversations he had with other men who had similar experiences. We're now getting kind of to the present, right? Um, and we're going to continue upon this theme of West Indian um, immigrants, because, like I said, Connecticut continues to have a high population of immigrants from that island area um, down to the south of us. Um, this MOSS camp was a program that was put on for a number of years. Um, the Connecticut Historical Society was involved as kind of a community partner. Um, we aren't anymore because the program kind of died out during COVID. I think they've started it up again, at least to some capacity. Um, and you can think of it sort of like a mentorship, um, job kind of internship program. Um, because groups of young West Indian women, so usually like high school, college age women, um, would join this program and over the course of months, they learned, you know, from community elders, right, from mentors. So people who knew, you know, um, details about costume making, about music and dance, um, about, you know, different kind of facets of culture. So there'd be different mentors for each of those. And it's kind of all based upon celebrations of carnival. And so by the end of this program, the women who had participated had each created, sewn, designed their own costume. Um, they had created, choreographed is the right word here, um, a presentation, you know, um, a celebration, dance, song, um, and then performed it at a number of community events. So this was sometimes parades in Hartford. This was going out to, you know, kind of like this sort of gathering, right? Going out to libraries and community centers across the state. So a really, really cool program. And it's that reminder, right, that there's, you know, kind of always different traditions, um, different practices present in our state, um, always has been, but as we have immigrant groups from all different areas, that's just going to continue to increase. <coughs> so programs like this, where people are very purposely, right, sharing that tradition, um, are very, very cool, I think. And like I said, I believe they started it up again, at least in the last year or so. So to wrap things up, I'm gonna bring us back to the past a little bit. You know, the last slide there really was celebrating the accomplishments of young black women. Um, and we see that, you know, um, still being maybe not as prevalent in our society today as it should be, but certainly, you know, a little bit more um, celebrated than it was back in, say, the mid-1800s. This sampler here was sewn by a young girl named Miranda Robinson. If we zoom in, you can see that she was only eight years old when she sewed this whole thing. 
Today, you will get to experience the creativity, ingenuity, and perseverance employed by African American slaves in their efforts to shepherd runaway slaves to safety. And Zinga's Daughters is going to provide a narrative and musical presentation about the Underground Railroad and Berlin's unique connection to it. 
Enzina's Daughters is an ensemble of women who share their gift of song and prose from the east coast of the USA to the west coast of Africa. Their performances include a variety of African, Caribbean, and African American music, drumming, storytelling, and poetry. Welcome, Enzina's Daughters. Ya do ya 
that were put upon the enslaved blacks, many wanted to run away. Many joined Quakers and Native Americans and created codes, signs, and signals that led to something that came to be known as the Underground Railroad. This, of course, was done secretly. An overturned kettle was a sign that the chairbacker, slave preacher, perhaps conductor, was having a midnight brush meeting deep in the woods. The singing of the spiritual let us break bread together was part of a code to meet in the woods near dawn on Sunday. A quilt hung out to air or dry might have a visual message for those who understood. A monkey wrench patch meant to get your tools ready and whatever else you might need to survive in the woods for a length of time or wait for the next message. Berlitz had a conductor on the Underground Railroad. His name was Milo Hodgkiss. His house still stands next to the Berlin Historic Center. It is thought that his home was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Reverend George W. Perkins, a pastor in Meriden, was also a conductor. He had runaways in his barn or attic and then would forward them to Mr. Hotchkiss in Kensington, part of Berlin. Hotchkiss would then send them on to New Britain to, to, New Britain, to Stanley Quarters 
and from Stanley Quarter, they would be shuttled to Farmington. songs, spirituals, had messages too. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for the captured and she never lost a passenger. 
Maybe it had something to do with the revolver that she carried with her. She would threaten anyone who had second thoughts. There's two things I got a right to, and, that, and these are death and liberty, and one of them I mean to have. No one will take me back alive, and when the time has come for me to go, the Lord will let them kill me. Harriet Tubman is said to have written a song, Wade in the Water. Slaves on a plantation would sing this song to alert runaways that the paddy rollers or patrols were out looking for them. The runaways would then know to get into the water so the hounds couldn't track them. There may be a bird call from afar to signal someone was there with a boat waiting to carry them across the window. Water. The window. Water. <laughs> someone with a lantern waiting on the opposite shore to help them or a light in an attic window of a house on a hill gather, signaling a safe haven, but no light at all. Stay hidden and wait till you get the next message. The colors mentioned in the song meant to look for someone wearing those colors, and that person would help you to the next station. Run, Mary, run. Ooh, run, Mary, run. Ooh, run, Mary, run, I say. 